Today, we're finding out which is the greatest franchise. Every franchise here has their all-time team, and we're going to see who's going to come out on top in this bracket. All the matchups are completely random, so no team has an advantage or a disadvantage. And of course, I want to give a big thank you to Xboxroom19 for creating this roster. And our first matchup is going to be the New Jersey Devils taking on the Nashville Predators. Looking at the Devils team, of course, we have a few current players on the team. Jesper Bratt, Nico Heischer, and Jack Hughes to name a few. But we also have guys like Zach Parise, who's back in his prime on the Devils, and Patrick Ellis. Looking at the defense, Scott Stevens has returned to lead the way at a 91 overall. And in between the pipes, of course, we have Martin Brodeur, and we already know he's going to be leading the way. Compared to the Devils, the Nashville Predators don't look as elite. Of course, Philip Forsberg's still here, but the rest of this team? Respectfully. Y'all aren't doing anything here. The defense, on the other hand, I gotta give respect to. Roman Yossi and Shea Weber is the first pairing, and then Matthias Ekholm and Ellis is the second pairing? They could do a bit of damage. And of course, we got guys like Pecorine and UC Soros sharing the net together, so I mean, you can't really bet against that tandem. It didn't take long for us to enter overtime, as in game one, we're tied 2-2 two two heading into the extra frame. A little over halfway into overtime, Jersey's taking a shot from the point, but it's gonna end up getting blocked. Langenburner is gonna be securing the loose puck, he's getting a shot off, which is beating Pecorine, and Jersey's taking game one. And in game two, Jersey's gonna be coming out on top with a goal from driver halfway through the third period. Game three would be a low scoring affair, but we're gonna be headed to overtime once again in a 2-2 tie. In the final minute of overtime, Ferdinand's gonna intercept the puck, and he's gonna dish that over to Holick. Holick's gonna find a wide open McLean in the slot, he's dishing that to him, and he's gonna beat Pecorine, and now the Devils, they got themselves a 3-0 series lead. And in game four, Marty Bordeaux's locking in, he's making 19 saves, which is leading to a devil shutout and they're off to the next round a clean sweep heading into our next matchup we're gonna have the Tampa Bay Lightning taking on the Buffalo Sabres the Tampa Bay Lightning forward core of course is looking absolutely fantastic bringing in guys like Barton St. Louis Brad Richards and Vincent LeCavier just to name a few the defense on the other hand is gonna look pretty similar as we have Hedman Chernak and Sergeyev leading the way while in between the pipes of course we're gonna have Andre Vasilevsky and he can definitely hold it down for this team looking at the Buffalo Sabres Jack Eichel's back on the team this team's looking pretty solid with a ton of legends Phil Housley and Rasmus Dillian are gonna be leading the defensive core and Dominic Hassan he's back in between the pipes and we're gonna see a great goaltending battle here before we dive into this next matchup though if you haven't already make sure you subscribe i'm trying to hit 40,000 subs by the end of the month and i'm only 150 away so if you haven't already make sure you subscribe it's free it only takes a second and it helps more than you can imagine but maybe i should take that back because game one's gonna be an incredibly high scoring one but tampa's coming out on top six to five and tampa would continue to keep rolling as they're taking game two four to two but in game three buffalo's offense is absolutely flying they're potting seven goals but tampa's also scoring five what happened to this great goaltending matchup i was looking forward to. The goaltending would be much better in game four as we're going to be headed to overtime in a 2-2 tie. Early into overtime, Tage Thompson is going to get a weak shot towards the net. I don't know what's happening here. It's deflecting off someone, but somehow Tage Thompson's scoring on that shot. Doesn't really matter how greasy the goal is, it's counting and we're headed to game five. And in game five, Stamkos is going to be leading the charge and now they're one game away from the second round. Vasilevsky is going to absolutely dominate game six. He's making 40 saves and he's allowing Tampa to advance to the next round. Our next matchup is going to see the Ottawa Senators taking on the San Jose Sharks. We're going to see a ton of legends returning to Ottawa and Jason Spezza, Daniel Alverson, and Danny Heatley, just to name a few. But looking at the defense, Thomas Chabon and Eric Carlson are back together. Both of them are in their prime now, so I'm excited to see what they're going to do. Well, in between the pipes, we're going to see Patrick Lalime taking the reins. The San Jose Sharks are bringing back a ton of recent players in Patrick Marlowe, Joe Thornton, and Joe Pavelski. The defense is in a similar situation with Mark Edward Vlasic back in his prime and Brett Burns, he's back from Carolina. And manning the net for the Sharks, that's going to be Evgeny and Nabokov. Two third period goals from the Senators are allowing them to take game one, but in game Game two, a late goal from Joe Pavelski is going to be forcing overtime. Early into overtime, Boyle's going to be bringing the puck into the zone and no one's picking him up whatsoever. By the time they do, he's dishing it over to Patrick Marlowe, who's beaten the goaltender and San Jose's taking game two. Jason Spezza is going to be scoring an incredibly late goal in game three to give Ottawa the 2-1 win. And then in game four, the late goals continue as they're scoring three in the final four minutes of the game to put San Jose on the brink of elimination. San Jose would be able to avoid elimination in game five as they hit a 4-0 lead and that's just going to be too much for Ottawa to overcome. And then in game six, San Jose is going to be putting the pressure on Ottawa and and now we're going to have to head to a Game 7 and a 4-3 San Jose win. In Game 7, San Jose is having a massive third period where they're going to be scoring three goals. They're coming back from a 3-1 deficit in the series, and they're taking down the Ottawa Senators. With San Jose advancing to the next round, we got to figure out who they're taking on, so we got the Minnesota Wild and Philadelphia Flyers up next. After bringing back all the legends, Kirill Kaprizov is still the highest overall in a 91, but we're adding guys like Dimitra and Marion Gabrick to the team, so that's definitely going to be a huge help for him. The defense has a ton of current players, but Ryan Suter is returning to the team, and now he's back in his prime. While Nick Backstrom, he's going to be holding it down in net for the Wild at an 86 overall. The Philadelphia Flyers team is looking absolutely elite with guys like Eric Lindros, Mark Rieke, and Bobby Clark leading the way. The defense might not be looking quite as strong on the other hand, but they still got guys like Mark Howe and Eric Desjardins leading the way. 
And the goaltending tam for the Flyers is one you don't have to worry about. Bernie Perrin and Ron Hextall are in between the pipes. But it's going to be neither of those goaltenders showing up in game one, as Backstrom's picking up the shout to give Minnesota game one. Philly would be able to get on the scoreboard in game two, but a Kaprizov hatchet's give Minnesota game two. Philly would be able to respond in game three, avoiding falling down to a 3 0 deficit with a 3 2 win. And then in game four, a late goal from Leclerc is going to be sending us to overtime. In the final seconds of overtime, Travis Konecki is going to bring the puck into the zone. He's taking a shot that Backstrom's going to save, but Bobby Clark, he's going to be right there for the rebound, and he's going to bury the winner to even this series up. Three goals in the second period from the Minnesota Wild are going to put them one game away from the next round, but Minnesota's not going to be advancing yet because we still have overtime in game six. Two and a half minutes into overtime, Mark Rieke is going to have the puck poked away from him. Marion Gabbard's going to secure that loose puck, and he's going to get enough time to rip a shot off. He's beaten the goaltender in Minnesota. They're now off to the next round. The next matchup we're going to be watching is the Dallas Stars taking on the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Dallas Stars forward core is looking pretty familiar, but we're adding Mike Madonna and Brendan Morrow to the core. The defensive core is going to be adding two major pieces in Zuboff and Darren Hatcher. Well, for the goaltending situation, we're adding Marty Turco to take over in net. So now we got the Toronto Maple Leafs, and this team's looking absolutely elite. Frank Mahovlich, Austin Matthews, and Mitch Marner on that first line. And then on the second line, you got Sittler, Matt Sedin, and William Nylander. So, I mean, how could you even bet against this team? The defense looks fantastic. Morgan Riley and Tim Horton are going to be leading that first pairing. Well, in between the pipes, you got a guy like Johnny Bauer. This Leafs team's definitely not a team I would be betting against. Johnny Bauer's going to prove he's the guy in game one, as he's picking up a 29 save shutout. But in game two, we're going to need a bit of overtime and a 2 2 tie. Six minutes into overtime, Toronto's keeping the puck into the zone, and William Nylander's going to get over to Sittler. He's getting a shot off and it's going through Turco's legs. He continues to fight at the net and he's going to be burying this one. The Leafs continue to push in game three as a late goal from Boris Almond is going to put Dallas on the brink of elimination. And in game four, a hat trick from Sittler is going to be completing the sweep for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Now that we know Toronto's off to the next round, we got to figure out who they're matching up against and we got the New York Rangers taking on the Vancouver Canucks. Our team Panarin is still going to be leading the forward court from the New York Rangers, but we're adding great pieces in Jean Ritelli and Rod Gilbert. The defense is getting some massive upgrades as Brian Leach has joined the way, and so is Ryan McDonough, and we also have Tony D'Angelo back. And in between the pipes, of course, we have King Henrik. That shouldn't be a surprise. And with him sharing the net with Shesterkin, this might be our best goaltending tandem. Moving over to the Vancouver Canucks, it's no surprise the Sedin twins are back here, and so is Pavel Bure. The defense is going to be a bit questionable, with Quinn Hughes being the best guy at an 88 overall, but they got Roberto Luongo in net, so he can hold it down for them. But maybe he can't hold it down as well as I thought, because the Rangers are going to be taking game one 4 to 1. But in game two, both goaltenders are locking in. It's tied 1 to 1, and we're going to need a bit of overtime. Early into double overtime, Rod Gilbert's bringing the puck into the zone. He's going to find Brian Leach. Leach is going to have tons of time and space to the puck, so he's going to load this one up, ripping it right over the blocker of Luongo, and he's giving the Rangers a 2-0 series lead. But it looks like one overtime game wasn't enough, because in game three, we're headed back in a 4-4 tie. With nine minutes left in overtime, Todd Bertuzzi is going to bring the puck into the offensive zone. He's going to spot Ryan Kessler wide open in the slot, and he's dishing it to him. Kessler's getting a very weak one-timer off, but somehow that's surprising Lundqvist, and he's beaten them, so Vancouver's still in this series. But they might not be in the series for too much longer, as Henrik Lundqvist, he's picking up a shutout in Game 4, and now Vancouver's on the brink of elimination. The Canucks aren't ready to fold yet, they're going to score four in answer to keep themselves in this series, and then in Game 6, an absolutely massive game from Vancouver, they're scoring eight goals, and they're going to be forcing a Game 7. With this series being so entertaining, there's only one way we can make it a bit more entertaining. Overtime in Game 7. In the final moments of the Vancouver power play, Burry's got the puck in the corner and he's going to send it over to Henrik Sedin. Sedin's getting a shot off, but Lundqvist is making the easy save, but it's going right to Daniel Sedin, and he's going to bury the overtime winner here, and the Vancouver Canucks are coming back from a 3-1 deficit to enter the next round. Our next matchup is going to be an absolutely legendary one, as we have the Pittsburgh Penguins taking on the Colorado Avalanche. Of course, a team like Pittsburgh, we don't really need to do too much talking about them. On the first pairing, Malkin, Crosby, and Yager, and on the second pairing, Jake Getzel, Mario Lemieux, Phil the Thrill, Kessel. That's going to be a very difficult offense to stop. The defense is of course going to have some legends as well as Sergei Gonchar and Larry Murphy lean that first pairing and in between the pipes Marc-Andre Fleury's back on the team. Looking at another team with tons of legends, guys like Pierre Forsberg, Joe Sackin, and Alex Tangay are back on the team. If you thought the Colorado defense couldn't get any better, it's going to be as we're bringing Rob Blake and Adam Foote onto the team. You're not stopping that respectfully. This defense is looking elite. And in between the pipes, they got a guy named Patrick Waugh. Not too sure if he's any good. Hopefully he can hold it down for them. Okay, ironically, he's not holding it down in game one. He's allowing four goals. But game two is going to be low scoring between the two. It's a 1-1 tie after 60 minutes, so we're going to need a bit of overtime. Halfway into overtime, Alex Tanke is going to send it over to Matt Duchesne. He's bringing the puck into the offensive zone. He's going to weave past the defender, and with none of the other defenders going to be picking him up, he's easily beaten the goaltender here, and Colorado's taking game two. Unlike game two, the offense is clicking for both teams in game three, and we're tied 5-5 after 60 minutes, so we're going to need a bit of overtime. With Pittsburgh on the power play in double overtime, Phil Kessel is going to bring the puck into the zone, and an absolutely elite pass is going right to Mullen. He's going to be wide open in front of the net. This goal doesn't 
doesn't happen without Phil the Thrill Kessel making elite plays like that. All right, I'm just gonna keep it a thousand. I'm tired of overtime games. Four to four, and we're headed to our third straight overtime game. Luckily, this overtime is not taking too long. Kale McCarr is getting the puck as he trails into the zone. He's taking a shot, but Joe Sack is gonna be right there for the rebound, and he's bearing this one to even the series up for Colorado. It wouldn't take long for the Penguins' offense to get rolling again as three goals in the second period is gonna put them one game away from the second round, but Colorado's offense is gonna be able to respond in game six. They're gonna be scoring five goals, and now we're needing game seven once again. And there's only one way for this series to be settled, our fourth overtime game. Because why wouldn't this series need another overtime game? Just a minute and a half into overtime, Peter Forsberg is going to be battling with Murphy for the loose puck. He's going to secure it and quickly give that over to Miko Rantanen. Rantanen's going to slowly walk into the zone and then he's ripping one right over Flurry's glove. He's sending the Penguins home and the Colorado Avalanche are off to the next round. Our next series is going to be a great rivalry matchup as we have the Chicago Blackhawks taking on the St. Louis Blues. Looking at the Chicago Blackhawks team here, there's absolutely no weaknesses, so I don't need to go in depth about what they have. And looking at the defense, that's pretty unstoppable too, with Duncan Keith and Chelios leading the way. And looking at the goaltending situation, they got this guy named Glenn Hall and the backups Ed Belfer. Not too sure if they're any good, but they could be pretty tough. Now, of course, looking at the St. Louis Blues, a legendary team. They've got Tarasenko, Bernie Federico, and Brett Hall in the first line. And then on the second line, you got guys like David Perron and Robert Thomas. So, I mean, how are you going to be able to stop Robert Thomas on the second line? He's elite. What can I say? The defense is going to have Chris Pronger and Alex Petrangelo leading the way. And in between the pipes, we're going to have a guy like Curtis Joseph and Jordan Binnington's backing him up. But if we're going based on all-time teams, Jordan Binnington should probably be about 90 overall. Because in that Stanley Cup season, he was him. It should be no surprise, but of course, the St. Louis Blues are going to be dominating game one as they're taking it three to one. And then in game two, the boys continue to roll and they're taking this one four to three. Okay, I understand St. Louis is an elite team and all, but how did we just shut out the Chicago Blackhawks of all teams? And just like that, the Chicago Blackhawks were just swept by the St. Louis Blues. The Chicago Blackhawks rightfully probably should have beat us. There's no point in worrying about that. We got to move on to our next matchup, and we got the Edmonton Oilers taking on the Anaheim Ducks. Of course, the Edmonton Oilers are going to have guys like Connor McDavid, Wayne Gretzky, Leon Drysell, Mark Messier, just to name a few. Can't forget about Yari Curry. And then the defense, you got Paul Coffey, Kevin Lowe, Darnell Nurse, and in between the pipes, they got Grant Fuhr holding it down. So this is going to be a tough team to stop. Looking at the Anaheim Ducks, we got Paul Korea, Ryan Getzlav, and Timu Solani leading the way. Leading the defense is going to be a guy by the name of Scott Niedermeyer, who's going to be a 92 overall. And in between the pipes, we got John Gibson with John Sebastian Shaguer backing him up. The offensive M2 was absolutely rolling through game one as they're taking this one six to three. And then Grant Fuhr is going to be taking it over in game two. He's making 30 saves for the shutout. The Edmonton Oilers offense just can't be stopped. Seven goals in game three. Edmonton might be my favorite to win it all just because of the offense they have. Because I don't see how you're going to stop Wayne Gretzky, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Mark Messier, all those guys together. I just can't see you stopping that respectfully. But Anaheim's going to be stopping it in game four because they're picking up the shutout. The timing on that couldn't have been worse. I just hyped up the offense and then they got shut out. Just disappointing. Pointing. I don't think it should be much of a surprise that Anaheim couldn't stop Edmonton forever as they're going to be potting three and three minutes in the third period and they're advancing to the next round. And who are they going to be taking on? Well, that's going to be decided between either the Detroit Red Wings or the Arizona Coyotes. Detroit Red Wings have had a ton of legends go through the ranks. So on the first line, we're going to have Ted Lindsay, Pavel Datsuk, and Gordie Howe leading the way. On the defense end, of course, Nick Lindstrom. It's no surprise that he's here. And with Terry Sawchuk in between the pipes, this is going to be a tough matchup for Edmonton. And you might be wondering why I'm saying Edmonton. Respectfully, this Arizona team is absolutely cooked. Clayton Keller is the best player at an 89 overall. Their offense looks abysmal. The defense might be even worse. Jacob Chikorin's their best guy, and he literally left like three months ago. And in between the pipes, they have 88 overall Mike Smith. Now, granted, Mike Smith could steal you a game or two, but you're not beating Detroit. Let's just keep it a thousand. Game one was much closer than I was expecting, as Detroit's only taken that one two to one. But the offense is going to wake up in game two as they're pot in six, and now they got themselves a 2 0 series lead. The Red Wings won't be stopped as Terry Sawchuk's picking up a 25 safe shutout, and then in game four, Sawchuk's picking up another shutout, and the Arizona Coyotes are eliminated. Not really surprised this one was a sweep. I would have been more surprised if Arizona took one game. Our next matchup is going to be featuring the Montreal Canadiens taking on the Hartford Whalers. We don't really need to go over Montreal too much because it's basically just all 90 overalls, so they have depth from top to bottom. Continuing to look at this team, this defense with Larry Robinson and Sergei Savar leading the way, that's going to be impossible to stop. And with a prime carry price in net, this team's going to cook Hartford. Like, respectfully, what is this team? Looking at the forward core, the best guy here is Sanderson, and he's an 85 overall, so I mean, no disrespect to Sanderson, but you're not beating this Montreal team. The defense, on the other hand, gets even worse. Didn't even think that would be possible, but it is. They got 70 overalls on their defense. And in net for Hartford, they got Big Mike, but Big Mike's not holding it down. Nah, this Hartford team's cooked. 
Montreal scoring three goals in the first period and that's all they're going to need so they're going to cruise to a 3-2 victory. And then in game two, Carey Price is picking up the shutout and they got themselves a 2-0 series lead. But it looks like Hartford's got a bit of fight in them because we're going to be headed to overtime in a 4-4 tie in game three. Halfway into overtime, Cunningworth's picking up the puck at the top of the offensive zone and he's going right to work in between all the defensemen and he's burying this one to give Hartford one game. I'm amazed this team took one game away from Montreal. In game four, they have the potential to steal another game away from Montreal as we're going to be head back to overtime once again. Halfway through the extra frame, some elite passing from Montreal is going to give them a great opportunity in front of the net and this is going to be an easy goal from Locke who's burying it. Montreal is going to choke a bit in game 5 as Hartford is going to score 5 and they're going to stay alive another day in this series. But in game 6, Montreal's pot in 6 and it should be no surprise they're taking down the Hartford Whalers. Heading over to our next matchup, we have the Calgary Flames taking on the New York Islanders. Matthew Kachuk and Johnny Hockey weren't gone too long because we're bringing them back to the team and they're on that first line with Elias Lindholm. And then you have guys like Theo Fleury, Joe Nwendek and Jerome McGinley on the second line. The defense on Calgary is just looking average as they have Dion Phaneuf and Al McGinnis leading the way, but they do have themselves a solid goalie net and Mike Vernon. Some of the legends returning to the New York Islanders are going to be Brian Trache, Mike Bossy, and Pat LaFontaine. Dennis Podfin is going to be joining the defense to give themselves a solidified number one, and the duo net for the Islanders is looking pretty solid. You got Billy Smith along with Igor Sorokin. The amazing defense from the Islanders is going to be seen in game one as they're shutting out the Calgary Flames, and in game two, that defense continues to roll, but Elias Lindholm is going to be potting two goals in the third period, but that won't be enough, and the Islanders got themselves a 2 0 series lead. The New York Islanders continue to score goals but they continue to also not allow that many as once again they're only allowing two and they're cruising to a 3-0 series lead. And here we are in game four where once again the New York Islanders are only allowing two goals. That's six goals in four games, less than two goals a game and now they're off to the next round as they complete the sweep. We're heading into our final few matchups but first we have to see who's coming out on top between the Los Angeles Kings and Winnipeg Jets. The Los Angeles Kings are going to be led by guys like Luke Robitaille, Marcel Dion and the recently retired Dustin Brown. The defense on the other hand, Drew Doughty's got to be the man because it doesn't look great here. Respectfully, the defense is definitely going to be letting this team down, but they do have Jonathan Quick in net, and he's back in his prime, so maybe he can turn that around for them. The Winnipeg Jets are going to be led by some familiar faces in the top six, and I'm talking about guys like Kyle Connor, Nikola Ehlers, Mark Scythe, Blake Wheeler, and Patrick Laine, but they are adding Dale Howard Chuck to the top six, and that's definitely going to be a boost for them. The defense is going to see Norris finalist Josh Morrissey, along with Dustin Bufflin, who's back and ready to roll, and in between the pipes for Winnipeg, of course, we got Connor Halbuck, and we already know what he can do. Game one was a close one, but Winnipeg's going to be coming out on top in a 3-2 victory, and in game two, we're going to be headed to overtime as we're tied 3-3 with the help of a late goal from Nikola Ehlers. Keith Kachuk's going to bring the puck into the neutral zone, but he's going to quickly dish that over to McLean before he's getting checked. As McLean gains control in the offensive zone, he's going to give it right back to Keith Kachuk as he's going to do a nice toe drag move, beating Jonathan Quick to put Winnipeg on top. The Winnipeg Jets wouldn't be able to build on that momentum, however, as Los Angeles is going to be scoring four goals and they're stealing game three. And in game four, we're going to be headed back to overtime in a 2-2 tie. Three minutes into overtime, some nice passing from the Los Angeles Kings is going to get the puck to Mitchell, who's at the point. He's taking a slap shot and on the way, Luke Robitaille is able to get a stick on that. He's deflecting this one into the net and he's evening the series up for the Kings. In game five, the Winnipeg Jets aren't going to allow the Kings to build on that momentum as they're stealing this one away five to two. But in game six, Jonathan Quick's going to stand on his head. He's making a 28 save shutout and now we're headed to game seven. In game seven, the current NHL player is going to be standing out. Four goals in the third period along with a shutout from Hal Buck is going to allow Winnipeg to advance and they're taking down the Los Angeles Kings. Now we just got to figure out who's going to be playing the Winnipeg Jets as we have the Carolina Hurricanes and Quebec Nordiques up next. The top six for Carolina is looking fairly familiar, but the bottom six is adding a ton of legends, so you're definitely going to have to pay attention to the depth on this team. But the defense, you're going to see Jacob Slavin and Dougie Hamilton leading the way. And in between the pipes, they got a 90 overall Cam Ward, and I'm expecting this team to do pretty solid. But we just can't count out the Quebec Nordiques, because they got three Stasis on the team with Peter Stasny leading the way. The defense, on the other hand, yikes. So maybe I take that back. Maybe Quebec won't put up much of a fight. No disrespect to Dan Bouchard. He's an 84 overall. I don't think you're going to be able to hold it down. Respectfully, of course. Carolina's coming out strong in game one as they're taking this one 4-2. And the offense just keeps clicking for Carolina. They're scoring five in game two. And now they've got themselves a 2-0 series lead. They just scored six in game three. Four goals in game one. Five goals in game two. Six goals in game three. So you know what's going to happen in game four? This team's going to get shut out. That would make the most logical sense with NHL 23 simulation. All right, so they're not getting shut out, but they are scoring five goals so they did just score 20 goals in four games they swept quebec and they're off to the next round after that dominant performance from carolina i want to see a closer series and we got the columbus blue jackets taking on the washington capitals the forward court from columbus is not looking elite whatsoever i don't even know if you can consider this good like the defense is okay you got zach Renski and seth jones leading the way this is a prime seth jones so you can't count him out and in between the pipes they do have a prime sergey barbarovsky and then here's the washington capitals with a prime alexander ovechkin prime nick backstrom mike gardner's there if getting kuznetsov 
Goff, and of course, Andre Burakovsky, the greatest playoff performer of all time. If you know, you know. Looking at the defense, we're going to see Mike Green returning to the team along with a healthy John Carlson. And in net, we're going to see Olaf, the former Vesna winner. I definitely didn't just look that up. I just clearly knew he was the 1999-2000 Vesna winner because I just know facts like that. Game one's going back and forth between these two teams, so we're going to need a bit of overtime. And in the final seconds of overtime on the power play, who's going to be scoring the game winner? None other than Andre Burakovsky. There is something different about this dude. I haven't figured out what, but Andre Burakovsky is him. Game two is going to be another close one, and we're headed to overtime. And Andre Burakovsky for the second game in a row. He might not be scoring, but he's picking up the assist on the game winning goal. In game three, Ovi scoring the lone goal as Olaf picks up the 33 safe shot, and now they're one game away from the next round. But Columbus is going to light the lamp in game four. They're scoring nine goals, and they're keeping themselves in this series. But it won't be for long because in game five, Washington's pointing two, including one from Andre Burakovsky. Just thought I mentioned that. They're off to the second round as Columbus is falling. So here we are with our final matchup. The floor. Florida Panthers taking on the Boston Bruins. Boston, legend after legend. Brad Marchand, Phil Esposito, Patrice Bergeron, David Pasternak, I can't name them all because we'll be here forever. And then on the defense, Bobby Orr, Ray Burke, Charlie McAvoy, the Bruins are definitely going to be one of the most balanced teams we're seeing today. But one thing that might be holding this team back is the goaltending situation. Now granted, these are the two guys on their alumni team. That's why Tim Thomas isn't here and that's why Tuka Rask isn't here. Do not stone me, this is EA. Granted, I could have created those players, but I didn't. So we're just going to roll with it. And now looking at the Florida Panthers, of course, Jonathan Huberto's back on the team and he's pairing up with Barakoff and Duclair. Trocek's back on the team and they still got Carver Hagee. There's quite a few current players on this team. Florida just doesn't have a ton of legends. On on the back end, Jay Bowmeister is going to be leading the way alongside Aaron Ekblad, and holding it down to net for this team is going to be John. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name. Not even going to give it a shot. In game one, John wasn't really holding it down in net as Boston's going to be pot in six. Luckily in game two, Florida's going to be able to respond and they're taking this one in a close 4-3 win. The Boston offense is just too tough to stop. They're going to be scoring six goals in game three and then in game four, they're going to be picking up the shutout and Florida's on the brink of elimination. In game five, for the third time in this series, Boston's going to be scoring six goals and the Florida Panthers, they're going to be falling in a five game series. So here we are, the first round's finally in the books. We have a ton of great matchups still to come, and our first one's going to be the New Jersey Devils taking on the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Devils are going to start the second round out with the bangers. They're going to be scoring three in answer to take game one. And then in game two, Marty Bordeaux is standing on his head. He's making 32 saves, and the Devils now have themselves a 2-0 series lead. But game three is going to require a bit of overtime as we're tied 4-4 after 60 minutes. In the final seconds of overtime, with Tampa Bay on the power play, Martin St. Louis is going to dish the puck over to Steven Stamkos. He's going to quickly release the puck, beating Martin Brodeur, and he's keeping Tampa in this series. Series. The Devils aren't going to allow Tampa to build on that momentum, however, they're going to score five goals in game four, and now they're one game away from the second round. And although this is a completely different Tampa Bay team, you can never sleep on the Lightning. They're going to be taking game five, two to one, and then they're going to dominate game six. Cooch is picking up the hat trick. Vasilevsky's he's got himself a shutout, and we're going to need game seven. And in game seven, it was back and forth the entire way, but Brain Point's going to lead the offense. He's picking up two goals, and Tampa's coming out on top in a 4-3 victory. With Tampa advancing to the next round, we're going to see who they're going to be taking on as we got the San Jose Sharks taking on the Minnesota. Minnesota Wild. San Jose's offense wouldn't get going until the third period in game one, so Minnesota's taking this one 3 to 1. In game two, Setaguchi is going to be scoring the lone third period goal, which is also a shorthanded one, so he's going to single handedly even this series up. And then in game three, we're going to have a tied game through 60 minutes, so we're going to need a bit of overtime. A little over halfway into overtime, Owen Nolan's going to be picking up the loose puck and he's getting a shot off. It's going to be an easy save for Nick Backstrom, but he's going to get his rebound, send it over to Tomas Rose, who's wide open in front of the net. A nice one timer's beaten Backstrom, and now San Jose's got the lead in the series. But what's better than one overtime? Overtime game, two overtime games, as the San Jose Sharks are going to be blowing a 4 1 lead in the third period, so we're going to need some extra time. Halfway into double overtime, Patrick Marlowe is going to enter the offensive zone with the puck. The defense is going to leave Joe Pavelski wide over in front of the net, so this is going to be an easy play for the Sharks. Marlowe over to Joe Pavelski, he's going to bury the easy one timer, and now they're one game away from the next round. And then in game five, a fantastic performance from Nabokov is going to be allowing San Jose to advance to the next round. The next matchup we're going to be seeing is the Toronto Maple Leafs taking on the Vancouver Canucks, and we're immediately heading into overtime in game one as we're tied 4 4. In the final seconds of overtime, off the ensuing faceoff, Vancouver's winning it. They're getting a shot towards the net. Todd Bertuzzi is going to crash right towards the front of the net. He's picking up the loose buck and he's beating Johnny Bauer. Vancouver will continue to roll, building on that momentum as they're stealing game two, four to two, and then they're dominating game three, pot and seven goals, and they've put Toronto on the brink of being swept. It should be no surprise though that the Toronto Maple Leafs are going to put up a fight. They're going to be surviving in game four with four goals, and then they're doing the exact same thing in game five, so now there's a better pressure on the Vancouver Canucks. But Vancouver's not going to be feeling that pressure. In game six, they're scoring five straight goals, including a shorthanded one, and they're sending Toronto home. So now we got to see who the Canucks are taking on, and that's going to be either the Colorado Avalanche or the St. Louis Blues. After completing a sweep against the Chicago Blackhawks, the St. Louis 
Blues aren't slowing down yet as they're taking game one three to one. Game two on the other hand it's going to be much closer as we're tied three to three through 60 minutes so we're going to need a bit of overtime. Early into overtime with St. Louis on the power play Petra Angelo's got the puck tied up against the boards. Brett Hall's going to be able to free the puck and he's going to work his way towards the front net. He's getting a shot off which is going to trickle in between Patrick Waugh's legs and St. Louis has now got themselves a 2-0 series lead and their sixth straight win. But the win streak from St. Louis is finally going to end as Colorado's going to score three on answer to keep themselves in this series. The goal scoring from Miko Randon is going to continue as he's scoring two and now this series is all evened up. And it looks like the Colorado Avalanche won't be messing around anymore. They're taking game five, four to two and St. Louis is on the brink of elimination. And in game six, it looks like Patrick Waugh is going to be the death of St. Louis. He's making 27 saves through the shutout as Colorado is taking down the Blues 3-0. So now we know what the top half of our bracket's looking like. Let's get to the bottom half and we got the Edmonton Oilers taking on the Detroit Red Wings. Game one was a close one the entire way, but two Jordan Everly goals is helping Edmonton take game one. The offense from most sides, the big story in game two is Detroit's pot and four to even this series up. McDavid and Drysdale are going to be showing out in the third period in game three, so we're going to need a bit of overtime and a 3-3 tie. Early into the extra frame, Sergei Fedorov is going to secure the loose puck. He's going to have enough time and space to rip one past Cranfier, so he's giving Detroit the series lead. But it's going to be hard to control the series lead as Edmonton's going to make a comeback in game four, and we're going to need overtime once again in a 3-3 tie. It doesn't look like Detroit will be holding on to this series lead for too long. Some nice passing from the Edmonton Oilers is going to allow Larson to tee one up from the point, and when he does, Leon Drysdale is able to get a stick on it, and he's going to be deflecting this one into the net to even the series. In game five, Detroit's having an answer for Edmonton as Terry Sawchuk's picking up the 32 save shutout, and Edmonton's now on the brink of elimination. Hey, you know what we haven't had enough of? Overtime games. And Pavel Datsuk's going to send us to another one as he's scoring with 26 seconds left in the game to even it up. Okay, I want you to pay attention to Mark Messier coming up center ice. There's four defenders around him. How does he get open like this? He literally parted the Red Sea. Nobody went and defended him. And it looks like game six might have been a sign for what's going to happen in game seven as the defense is completely falling apart for Detroit. Edmonton scoring six and they're off to the next round. And who are they going to be taking on? Well, it's going to be either the Montreal Canadiens or New York Islanders. Montreal is going to have full control of game one as they're taking this one four to one. And in game two, it was a high scoring affair once again, five to five. So we're going to need a bit of overtime. Seven minutes into overtime, Shutt's bringing the puck into the offensive zone and a nice little move is going to get him past the defenseman. And he's making a nice cross ice pass over to Sure. And he's going to be beating Billy Smith to give Montreal the 2-0 series lead. The New York Islanders, however, aren't going to be going down easy as John Tavares is going to be scoring a late goal in the third period to send this one to overtime. At the nine minute mark in overtime, some nice passing from the Islanders is going to allow Pelk to tee one up from the point and flatly, he's going to be deflecting this one into the back of the net to keep the Islanders in the series. And it looks like the New York Islanders are going to build off that momentum because five unanswered is going to be evening up the series. But this Montreal team's just not full of slouches. They have a ton of talent on this team and the offense is waking up. They're going to be scoring four goals in game five and then in game six, they're scoring four goals once again and they're going to be eliminating the New York Islanders. We have two more matchups left in the second round, so we're going to start with the Winnipeg Jets taking on the Carolina Hurricanes, and this game's going to be needing some extra time early on as we head to overtime in game one. Early into the extra period, Dustin Bufflin's bringing the puck into the offensive zone, and he's going to slide this one in between four defenders over to Kyle Connor, and Kyle Connor, with that much space, he's easily burying this one to give Winnipeg game one. The offense from the Winnipeg Jets would continue to roll heading into game two as they're scoring four to take a 2-0 series lead. And then in game three, with 59 seconds left in the game, Steen scoring the game winner, and Winnipeg's one game away from the second round and Carolina, they're one game away from being swept. I'm very surprised this Carolina Hurricanes team just got swept by the Winnipeg Jets. Nothing against Winnipeg, but just based on the amount of talent we have on these teams, how are you getting swept? You couldn't take one game away? Granted, Chicago got swept to St. Louis, so I mean, that just shows anything can happen. So here we are with our final matchup of the second round, the Washington Capitals taking on the Boston Bruins. Game one's going to be a low scoring one, but Boston's going to be coming out on top in a 2-1 victory. And it seems like a similar thing's going to be happening in game two, but this time Washington's coming out in the 2-1 victory. Four goals are going to be scored in game two, but two of them are coming from Pasta and two of them are coming from Mike Gardner. So that means we need a bit of overtime. So here we are in triple overtime with five minutes left. And Nathan Horton just said, nah, I'm him. He's going to bring this puck into the zone, deke around everyone, and he's beating Olaf to give Boston the series lead. But it doesn't look like one overtime game was enough because we're going to need another one in game four. Luckily, overtime in game four wouldn't be taking as long. We're about five minutes in when Boncher gets a shot off, which beats the goaltender, and he's evened up this series at two games apiece. In game five, Hunter's going to be scoring two huge goals for the Capitals, and he's putting Boston on the brink of elimination. But you know we haven't had enough of? Overtime. So we're headed back there in game six. With Boston on the power play, David is going to be ringing one off the post, but he's getting his own rebound, and he's going to go to work here. He's going to dish it over to Tori Krug. Krug's getting a quick shot off, and Brad Marchand, he's deflecting this one into the net, and we're going to need ourselves game seven. And in game seven, Mike Gardner had the hat trick. Everything looked great for the Washington Capitals and then they blew it. Boston's going to be scoring three straight goals to take this one and now they've advanced to the second round while Washington's falling. 
So now we're down to our final eight teams. We have the Tampa Bay Lightning taking on the San Jose Sharks, the Vancouver Canucks taking on the Colorado Avalanche, the Edmonton Oilers have got their hands full with the Montreal Canadiens, and the Winnipeg Jets, they're going to have to take on the Boston Bruins. Let's start with our first matchup in the Tampa Bay Lightning taking on the San Jose Sharks. San Jose is going to be having a massive third period in game one as they're going to be scoring four unanswered to take this one. And then in game two, the offense from San Jose continues as they're going to be scoring five goals and they've now got themselves a 2-0 series lead. Tampa would finally get their offense clicking in game three as they're going to be scoring four third period goals to keep themselves in this series. Vasilevsky's carrying the way in game four as he's picking up a 36 save shuttle while Tampa's pot in three so now they've evened this series up. Tampa and San Jose are going to be exchanging goals the entire game so after 60 minutes we're headed into overtime in a 2-2 tie. With six minutes left in overtime, Clorin's got the puck behind the net and he's going to send it over to Hedman. Hedman's taking a slap shot, but Clorin's going to get in front of the net. He's deflecting this one, and he's going to give Tampa Bay the lead in the series. And Tampa's not looking back after that. Vasilevsky's going to be picking up another shutout, and the Tampa Bay Lightning are on to the final four. And who are they going to be taking on the final four? Well, that's going to be either the Vancouver Canucks or Colorado Avalanche. Nathan McKinnon's picking up two goals in game one. He's helping to lead Colorado to a game one win. But in game two, goals are going to be exchanged between the Avs and the Canucks, so we're headed to overtime in a 2-2 tie. On the ensuing Colorado power play, Alex Tangay is bringing the puck into the zone, but he's going to have that poked away from him. He's quickly regaining control that puck and then he's going to be ripping one right over the blocker of Roberto Luongo and Colorado's got themselves a 2-0 series lead. In game 3 things looked absolutely fantastic for Colorado as they had a 4-1 lead at one point. Emphasizing the word had because Vancouver's coming back and they're going to be setting this one to overtime. Off the face off Quinn Hughes is going to get a shot towards the net but Patrick Waugh is going to make the save. Burke's going to go collect that puck in the corner and he's going to give it right back to Hughes who's sending it over to Sedin and with a quick flick of the wrist from Sedin he's sending that over Patrick Waugh's blocker and he's keeping the Canucks in this series. And because we haven't had enough overtime games let's head back to another one in game 4. At the halfway point in overtime, Peter Forsberg is going to bring the puck into the offensive zone, and he's going to send it over to Nathan McKinnon. McKinnon's heading towards the goal line, but he's going to do a quick stop and go move, and then circle back to the slot, and with no one picking him up, he's going to be ripping this one past for Burl Luongo. Although the Vancouver Canucks are down 3-1 in the series, the adversity continues to be shown, as they're going to be fighting back in Game 5, and then in Game 6, they're going to be winning another close one, so we're going to need a Game 7. But in Game 7, Patrick Waugh is going to be standing on his head, a 35 save shutout, Colorado scoring 2, and now they're off to the Final Four. The next matchup we're going to be witnessing is definitely going to be a good one as we have the Edmonton Oilers taking on the Montreal Canadiens, two high-powered offenses. I can't wait to see what's going to happen. Montreal is going to be coming out of the gate quick as they're going to be taking game one 4-1, and then they're doubling down on that in game two as they're going to be picking up another two goals, and that's leading to a 2-0 series lead. All right, I was expecting Edmonton to put up a much bigger fight than this. Montreal now has a 3-0 series lead, and the offense from Edmonton has been absolutely abysmal. And just like that, in game four, Montreal is completing the sweep over the Edmonton Oilers. Where was this team's offense? Like, it was just non-existent. So after that dominant performance from Montreal, we got to see who they're going to be taking on, and that's going to be either the Winnipeg Jets or the Boston Bruins and if you haven't watched any of my previous videos it's going to be the Winnipeg Jets I can tell you right now Winnipeg's going to get past Boston but I might have spoke a bit too soon because Nathan Horton's going to be taking over in game one he's got the hat trick including the game winner with 31 seconds left in the game and Boston's taking game one but Winnipeg of course they're going to be responding in game two and they're evening up the series Brian Marchant would try to spark the comeback in game three but it's not going to be enough and Winnipeg's taking this one two to one Connor Halbuck's going to be the hero once again in game four as he's making 35 saves while Winnipeg's picking up two goals and now they got themselves a 3-1 series lead. And in game five, I feel like we've heard this before. Brad Marchand's going to try to spark the offense in the third period, but he's not going to be able to, and the Winnipeg Jets are taking down the Boston Bruins. In the past three games, Boston scored three goals. They've all come from Brad Marchand. You did your part, my guy. The rest of the team just folded on you. You hate to see it. So let's get right into our final four matchups, and we have the Tampa Bay Lightning taking on the Colorado Avalanche. Last year's Stanley Cup final, but things are a bit different this time around. Martin St. Louis is going to be carrying the way for Tampa in game one, as he's going to be picking up the hat trick. Game two is not going to have nearly as much scoring as Patrick Waugh is going to be picking up the shutout as Rob Blake's going to score the long goal. Anton Strollman's going to be scoring a late goal in the third period and that's going to end up being the winner for Tampa as they take a 2-1 series lead. But in game four, Tampa and Colorado are going to be exchanging goals throughout the entire game so we're going to be headed to overtime. With a little over five minutes left in overtime, TJ Comper's got the puck tied up against the boards. Anthony Sorelli's going to be able to free it. He's sending it over to Mo Dean who's going to tee this one up and he's going to steal this game away for Tampa. But of course we know the Colorado Avalanche have a ton of grit and grind so they're going to be stealing game five away to keep themselves in this series. And in game six, it's going to be a low scoring one and we're going to need overtime after 60 minutes. Incredibly early into overtime, Eric Chernak's going to work and somehow he's getting past two defenders on his way towards the front of the net. Then some nice passing from Tampa is going to allow Martin St. Louis to get a great opportunity. He's scoring the game winner and Tampa, they're off to the Stanley Cup final. But who are they taking on? Well, that's either going to be the Montreal Canadiens or the Winnipeg Jets. 
Game one was an incredibly close one between these two teams, but two goals from the Canadians in the third period, including one from Guy Lafleur, is giving them game one. Of course, you can't sleep on the Winnipeg offense because that's waking up in game two. They're scoring four and they're evening up this series. The offense from Winnipeg isn't slowing down after that. They're going to score six goals in game three, and then in game four, it's going to be a close one. But once again, the Jets are coming out on top in a 2 1 win, and Montreal's on the brink of elimination. With all the legends on Montreal, you already know they're not going to be folding. They're taking game five in a 4 2 victory, but in game six, the Winnipeg offense just can't be stopped. They're picking up seven goals and they're off to the Stanley Cup final. So here we are, the Tampa Bay Lightning taking on the Winnipeg Jets. What is wrong with this Winnipeg team? I don't know how many videos it's been where the Winnipeg Jets have either won it all or made it all the way to the final. It's beyond ridiculous at this point. But none of that matters. We have two teams left, Tampa Bay, Winnipeg, who's coming out on top. And what a surprise, the Winnipeg Jets in game one, they're going to be shutting out the Tampa Bay Lightning while they're picking up three goals. At this point, I'm convinced that Winnipeg's the greatest franchise of all time because it really just doesn't make sense. Okay, I'm taking all that back. Tampa just scored eight goals in game two and they've evened this series up. It's going either way. Who knows who's going to come out on top. The offense from Tampa would continue to click as they're going to pick up four goals in game three and they've got themselves a 2-1 series lead. But it's going to take more than 60 minutes in game four because we're going to be headed to overtime in a 4-4 tie. Five minutes into overtime, Braden points bringing the puck into the offensive zone, but he's going to have it poked away into the corner. He's going to go quickly retrieve that and then send it over to Vincent LeCavier who's crashing towards the net. He's going to secure this puck, get a quick wrist shot off. He's beating Connor Halbuck and the Tampa Bay Lightning are now one game away from hoisting the Stanley Cup. And in game five, that's exactly what's going to be happening. Tampa Bay is going to come out on top in a 4-3 win, and they're defeating the Winnipeg Jets to prove they're the greatest franchise in the entire NHL. But I don't think that's actually true because the Winnipeg Jets made it all the way here. They've made it to the finals in like nine videos. It makes no sense. So I think this actually proves Winnipeg's the greatest franchise of all time. I don't know. That's up for debate. You guys can decide in the comments below.